We are concluding our series in Acts today. Now Paul is in the midst of telling his story in the gospel to powerful leaders, non-Christians, the unreached. And when we see how Paul responds to these people, we will have a better idea how we ought to respond in our contexts. Last time we saw Paul have an audience with Governor Felix. So Felix uh, didn't last too long in that role, uh, as we're told at the end of chapter 24, that uh, two years passed, and Felix was then succeeded by another guy named Portius Festus. So what happened? Well, according to the uh, to Josephus, the historian, there was an outbreak of civil conflict between the Jews and Gentiles in Caesarea. Felix ended up sending troops to deal with the conflict in such a way that it caused quite a lot of bloodshed. Now, Rome really didn't like how he handled that, and so they recalled him. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any record of uh, Felix doing anything with Paul for those couple of years, and Festus uh, ended up inheriting all of Felix's uh, unfinished cases, or I guess problems, if you want to call them that. Now, in these final chapters in Acts, Luke gives us the story of how Paul goes from Jerusalem to Rome. Paul, as a Roman citizen, appeals to have his case heard by Caesar, which is his right. And once Paul gets to Rome, there's not too much else we're told other than Paul continued to preach for a couple more years. And history tells us that Paul eventually died a martyr's death after presumably having his case heard by Caesar. And that's all about that's about all we can say uh, in any case some things do happen in these chapters and that's what I want to look at today how did Paul live out the final days as he headed to Rome we're not going to read uh, all four chapters so I'll be summarizing most of it and reading uh, you know a couple small sections all right so the Jewish leader uh, the Jewish leadership meet with this new governor, Portius Festus, in Jerusalem. And they ask him to bring Paul from Caesarea to Jerusalem, saying that they want to present their charges against Paul to Festus, with Paul there. But what they were actually going to do was to ambush and kill Paul as he's on the way to Jerusalem. Now, Festus could see the charges against the apostles, uh, against Paul, the charges were weak, having more to do with religious doctrine, but wanting to have a good relationship with his Jewish, his new Jewish people, he does ask Paul to go to Jerusalem and stand trial. Now, why Jerusalem? Now, that's where the alleged crimes took place, and that's where the Jewish court is. So the advantage would be to the Jews. But Paul speaks out about the truth to his rights, and he defends himself before Festus. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 8, 10, and 11. Paul says this, I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law, or against the temple, or against Caesar. I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done anything wrong to the Jews, as you yourself uh, know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has a right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. So Paul has been in prison for a couple of years now. He knows any advantage the Jews would get would mean he wouldn't get a fair, a fair trial. But honestly, I think Festus isn't sure what to do. I mean, he's, he's the new guy here. On the one hand, he wants to be on the good side of the Jews to make them happy so they won't disturb the Roman peace. But on the other hand, these charges against Paul don't seem that serious to warrant death. Now, Paul says he wants to go to Caesar and as a Roman citizen. As I said before, he has that right. And Festus, now probably with a sigh of relief, now feels he can wipe his hands clean of this case and let Caesar 
deal with this issue. The problem is that uh, Festus still needs to write a report to Caesar just to let him uh, know what exactly the charge uh, the charge is and why he's sending Paul to him. Uh, since Paul is allegedly breaking religious law only, now, Festus's job is about governance and administration, not dealing with religious uh, religious matters. However, death is being advocated by Paul's accusers, so it does become a bit more serious because execution is Rome's responsibility. So Festus doesn't really doesn't know what to do, and so he asks his buddy, um, King Agrip uh, Agrippa, just for a second opinion about Paul. And Paul gets to speak with King Agrippa now. And when he does, he doesn't really speak about his um, about his rights like he did with Festus. Instead, he educates and reveals to Agrippa and Festus, who's also listening, about how God's plan for the world plays out through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, at the same time, Paul reveals his own testimony and experience of God and how all of that led him where he is now. He says this, So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to, to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and all Judea, and then to the Gentiles, and preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me, but God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and, as, as the first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Now at this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it was not, it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. You know, this isn't much of a defense. You know, leave it to Paul to use this opportunity to turn his own defense into a gospel opportunity and challenge, uh, and challenge to his listeners to imitate his example. You know, as crazy as Paul might sound, Agrippa and Festus don't believe he deserves death. But you know, Paul is just so good at recognizing the opportunities before him to let people hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would all be aware of the opportunities around us as well and to respond similarly. Alright, so from here, Paul finally sets off to Rome. And Paul is now in a boat with uh, over 250 people, some prisoners, Roman soldiers, um, even some friends of Paul's, all bound for Rome. And when Paul notices the seas changing at one point, he speaks out and he warns everyone that the journey is about to get really dangerous. However, all the soldiers ignore Paul. I mean, why would they listen to him? He's a prisoner, right? And sure enough, High winds and dangerous waters happen. And Paul's like, see, I told you so. No, I'm just kidding. He doesn't do that. Anyway, they miraculously, they survive. And Luke report, uh, records another speech um, by Paul. He says, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail to Crete then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. Okay, so he, maybe he did say, I told you so. Um, but now I urge you to keep up your courage, not because one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God told, 
of the angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you all the lives, uh, the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. What does Paul sound like here? He doesn't sound like a prisoner on death row. But a compassionate and inspiring godly leader in a difficult situation. He's the one keeping people's nerves at bay. And so just before they reach land, Paul speaks again. He says, just before, it says, just before dawn, Paul urges them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. Uh, you need to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in front of all of them. Then he broke it and began to eat. And they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. So in that moment of eating, he noticed what Paul does. Notice those words. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and they ate. What's Paul doing? Well, he's having what looks like a communion meal with all these other prisoners and passengers and soldiers. Now, for those who were Paul's companions, this meal would probably a reminder of God's journey mercy in the boat. But what about the non-believers eating this meal? Now, to them, it might have just been another meal for them. It's food. But perhaps, unbeknownst to them, uh, we're being told that they were participating in the mercy and grace of God. that they were participating in the mercy and grace of God. And I think that's something we need to really reflect on. You know, God's grace is so big that even those who don't worship God get to enjoy the blessings of God through our actions. How we live, we live as agents of God's blessing in this world. Now eventually, Paul gets to Rome, where he gets to continue to preach to the Jewish leaders there. Now amazingly, they are actually receptive compared to the Jewish leaders uh, in like Jerusalem and in other places. Now you have to remember, this is a time before social media and email and text messaging or viral videos. Look at what they say. Uh, uh, when Paul begins to defend himself. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there have, has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are. For we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. So they've heard about Paul. And, they rec and, and they're saying that, well, none of their peers have said anything bad about Paul. And so they're interested. And because of that, Paul is able to preach boldly and without hindrance. Paul's in Rome. Now, you know, there's that saying, all roads lead to Rome. And if you're going to make it big with anything, you're going to have to do it here in Rome. Rome represents the world. Remember in Acts 1.8, the beginning of Acts, Jesus says to his disciples, you will be my disciples, uh, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Paul being in prison isn't a hitch in God's plan. It's God being unstoppable, using our situations for his purposes of getting the message of salvation to the world. And wherever Paul is or ends up is no accident. There's purpose. And Paul knows that. In Acts 1.8, the key word there is witness. 
It's what Jesus says to his disciples at the end of Luke, and what Jesus repeats to his disciples at the beginning of Acts. See, what we see here is Paul being a witness of Jesus Christ. But do you notice whose audience is here? The gospel isn't just for the church or within a Christian context. Paul is living out the gospel in a secular world before the non-Christian world. For Paul, it didn't matter where he was because wherever he found himself, he was a witness for Christ. And that's all of our calling in Christ Jesus. Whatever situation you're in, whatever context you're in, whether it's difficult or not, convenient or not, we all have a choice to make about how we live our lives. Wherever we are, we always carry our calling to be a witness of Christ Jesus. As witnesses, we are agents of God in a world where many still do not know Him. So we speak, we defend, we tell, we inspire, we bless with everything that we do. Something that might help us think how to live as Christians or remind us how um, I'm thankful for one of the letters of the late Pope John Paul II, who wrote about the laity, you know, regular Christians in the church. And in the letter, he says, uh, he says, each person receives grace and dignity to participate in the threefold mission of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. Each person receives grace and dignity to participate in the threefold mission of uh, three, threefold mission of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. And I think that's a great rem- uh, way to remember how uh, we join with God as witnesses in the world. We join as priests in, in this world, as prophets in this world, and as kings in this world. The role of prophet has to do with speaking out, debating, proclaiming, sometimes even defending. And we see Paul embodying that when he speaks out and defends himself before Festus and Agrippa. Paul desires truth and justice and righteousness. The role of priest has to do with educating, revealing, reflecting, empathizing. And we see Paul embodying that as well when he educates King Agrippa on Christianity and and later the Jews in Rome about the gospel message, revealing who God is and what his Messiah's purpose is. And the role of king has to do with symbolizing, integrating, empowering, uh, wisdoming, showing wisdom, uh, inspiring. Again, we see Paul embodying that when he's on the boat, giving insights about the dangerous waters. And later on, when he he inspires and gives hope to the people on board the ship. As Paul joins... God in God's work. He is imitating Christ by embodying the traits of prophet, priest, and king. God's plan and purposes for his salvation to go to the ends of the world will be fulfilled as we embrace our calling as witnesses, imitating Christ wherever we go. And as we do that, we will see the unstoppable God work in truly amazing ways. Let's pray. Father God, would you remind us of the calling you have placed in our lives, where we are to be your priests, your prophets, your sons and daughters in this world. Would you empower us, God, to be people who reflect your truth, your wisdom, your righteousness, your blessings to this world. Use us, God, as your agents. Use us as your people in a world that needs you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.